In this lesson, we're going to go over the doctrine of state action or the state action requirement. So state action is a gateway issue. It's really important to recognize and to note here before we jump into anything that step number one in a constitutional law individual rights analysis will always be to think about state action. This is our gateway issue. So if we're looking at a fact pattern and we see that a person is alleging that their individual constitutional rights have been violated, right? They're alleging that there's been an infringement of their constitutional rights. There's been a constitutional violation regarding individual rights. The first thing we have to consider is the doctrine of state action. And the good news here is that the doctrine of state action as a concept, as a whole, is a really simple idea. We'll see the application of this can become really complex. In certain situations, it can become even contradictive or paradoxical. So state action can become a very difficult analysis in certain situations. But as a big picture idea, it's pretty straightforward. To find that a given action violates the US Constitution, that action generally must be attributable to the state. And for our purposes, when we say state and the context of state action, we really just mean local government, state government, or federal government. To quickly review here, if we think about the Bill of Rights in the 14th Amendment, because these are the main constitutional protections we're going to be dealing with. The first 10 amendments, and really, for our purposes, we're really dealing with the, in criminal, or in criminal procedure, we're dealing with the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment a little bit, but for our purposes in constitutional law, we're really just dealing with the First Amendment here, you know, and the 14th Amendment. We'll talk a little bit about the Fifth Amendment due process clause, but really our biggest focus in the Bill of Rights is going to be the First Amendment, a little bit of the Fifth Amendment, and then we're going to do a lot on the 14th Amendment as well. Okay, but again, when we're trying to define what the state is in terms of state action, it is important to recognize some of these big picture constitutional law principles. And that is when the Bill of Rights was first ratified, to go all the way back to the beginning for a minute here, if we think back to the late 1700s when the Bill of Rights is being ratified, the first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, it's important to recognize that the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. It did not apply to the states. Okay, but of course we know today through the incorporation doctrine, basically 200 years of case law, the Supreme Court has adopted all of the most important protections for our purposes, basically the entirety of the first, second, fourth, and eighth amendment has been fully incorporated into the 14th amendment due process clause. And portions of the fifth and sixth amendment have also been incorporated into the 14th amendment due process clause. This is very important because the 14th Amendment applies to the states. So as these amendments get incorporated into the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause, well, we know the Bill of Rights at default applied to the federal government. This is how they were ratified and drafted from day one. And then through the incorporation doctrine, these amendments, the first, second, fourth, and eighth in their entirety, in portions of the fifth and sixth, have been incorporated into the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. 14th Amendment applies to the states. So it's a long-winded way of saying that the 1st, 2nd, 4th, and 8th Amendment in their entirety apply to the states and the federal government, or I should say the federal government and the states. We know that those applied to the federal government originally at default. That's how they were written, and they're applied to the states through the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. It's the same idea with equal protection derived from the 14th Amendment. The 5th Amendment, remember, Bill of Rights, at default, first 10 amendments applies to the federal government. And in the 5th Amendment, we have a Due Process Clause, just like the 14th Amendment. So what happens is, when we get the 14th Amendment and equal protection, we know the 14th Amendment, at default, only applied to the states. But through the case law, seminal cases like Balling v. Sharp, we use the 5th Amendment Due Process Clause to apply equal protection to the federal government. 
and the states. Okay, so this is all a really long-winded way of saying all of the protections we're going to go over, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, equal protection, due process, both substantive and procedural due process, all of these protections apply to the states and they apply to the federal government, basically through these processes. Okay, the Bill of Rights applies to the states through the 14th Amendment due process clause and equal protection is applied to the federal government through the 5th Amendment due process clause, which effectively means all of the individual rights we're really going to focus on that are commonly tested apply both to the state governments and federal government, which means for our purposes and state action, when we're defining what the state is, it's important to recognize that we don't literally mean the state, like the state of Texas or the state of New York, the state of Florida. We just mean basically any government body, whether that's local, state, or federal government. Okay, so that's just important. We should think of the word state in terms of state action more like a legal term of art that just refers to the government, whether that's local, state, or federal government. So when you hear the word state action requirement, you can kind of in your head think the government action requirement. Again, because all of these rules, all of these protections that we're going to go over apply both at the state and federal level, okay? The last note to make here, and we have touched on it, is there is one notable case where the state action requirement does not apply. If we're thinking about this big picture, right, the idea is, hey, look, some of these rights or restrictions only apply to the states. Some of these rights and restrictions only apply to the federal government. Today, we know the most important ones that we're going to talk about apply to both the states and the federal government. But of course, some of these restrictions even apply beyond the government. They apply to private parties as well. And the most notable one there is the 13th Amendment prohibition of slavery. Prohibition of slavery not only applies to the states and the federal government, it also applies to private parties. So if ever you were dealing with a 13th Amendment analysis, which would be pretty rare, but if you did see a 13th Amendment issue tested in the context of state action, there is no state action requirement for the 13th Amendment. Okay, but for every other individual right we're going to go over, Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, equal protection, substantive due process, procedural due process, all of these you know, really core major rights that we're going to go over. State action is our gateway issue. And when we try to define the word state, we know that that really means local, state, or federal government. Okay, that's all the big picture stuff out of the way. From here, we can really start to get into the actual analysis of the doctrine of state action. So if we remember back to kind of what I said here, as a big picture concept, state action is pretty straightforward, right? Just as a concept, it's a simple idea. The application is complex, but the idea is simple. Under the doctrine of state action, to find that a given action violates the US Constitution, that action generally, remember outside of the 13th Amendment, must be attributable to the state, which we now know really just means local government, state government, or federal government. Okay, so probably the most basic example of this, right, if we want to start with a really basic example and then kind of go from there. Think about, you know, when you were growing up as a kid. You know, I'll give an example from my own childhood, right, but probably a lot of us had similar experiences here. You know, when I was a kid, and I was growing up, my dad established a lot of household rules that my brothers and I had to adhere to. I was the youngest of three, and my dad was, you know, very much the disciplinarian of the household. And, you know, he liked to establish rules and he really liked to define the rules so much so that he actually had like a big thing of parchment paper. And he put this on our refrigerator in the kitchen for my brothers and I to see and for everyone else to see that came to our household. And it laid out basically our household rules. And he had a lot of rules 
you know, and most of them, by the way, very reasonable stuff that you would expect. Things like, uh, you know, you gotta keep your room clean or to go out with your friends, you have to finish your homework first. I mean, all the basic stuff, probably a lot about, you know, doing chores, that kind of thing. You know, but if you really analyzed these rules, you know, in terms of constitutional law, you could probably find some rules in there that would trigger different issues in our individual rights analysis. Like take the First Amendment, for example. You know, my dad's first rule in our set of rules was always no complaining. It was always rule number one. Because by the way, the rules changed all the time and they were even seasonal. We had different rules when we were in school and when we were off for the summer. So the rules were always being updated and you know we had seasonal rules. But basically, no matter what, the first rule was always no complaining. And really, this was referring to like trivial complaints. For instance, if my mom were to cook food, right? We couldn't complain about the food. This would be a violation of that first rule, right? So it was really like no trivial complaining or whining was allowed. And that was always the first rule that we had, okay? So if we think about that though, and we really analyze that rule, could we say that that's a violation of my First Amendment rights? You know, my brothers and I, you know, we're US citizens, we enjoy First Amendment protection, First Amendment rights. So is this a violation of our freedom of speech? When my dad comes along and puts on the refrigerator that we're not allowed to complain, basically, <laughs> Is that a violation of the First Amendment? Well, what's the first thing we always do? Remember, doctrine of state action is a gateway issue. So if we're looking at a fact that on a constitutional law exam and we see that a person is alleging that their constitutional rights have been violated, here we see a person's alleging that their First Amendment right to freedom of speech is being violated, what's the first thing we do? We think about state action. Under the doctrine of state action, to find that a given action violates the U.S. Constitution, here the First Amendment, that action, my dad posting the rules on the fridge, generally must be attributable to the state, local, state, or federal government. Here, can we attribute my dad establishing these rules and enforcing these rules to the state? Can we attribute his enforcement of these rules to local government, state government, or federal government based on the facts that I've provided? The answer is no, of course not. My dad's a private actor. We have no government involvement here. There's nothing in that fact pattern that we could attribute to the government. So the state action requirement in this fact pattern would not be satisfied which means there is no constitutional violation, right? To find that a given action violates the U.S. Constitution, here the First Amendment, that action, my dad establishing these rules, would have to be attributable to the government. We can't attribute my dad establishing rules in our household to the government, so there's no First Amendment violation, okay? And this really simple example really illustrates the policy of the state action requirement. Probably to most people, we generally think in a free democratic society, there should be a line drawn between pure private action and state action. And basically, private action should not be subject to the same constitutional restrictions as state action, right? The idea is people should enjoy you know, some form of private liberty, you know, private actors, private individuals engaged in purely private action should probably enjoy some private freedom, some private liberty, you know, outside of the constitutional requirements we hold the government to. This is just like the policy idea of, you know, these individual freedoms, basically private liberties is what you'll hear this referred to as, right? So in that case, the idea is, you know, my dad should enjoy the private liberty to basically raise his children however he wants. Whether you agree with his rules or not, you know, probably most people would agree that it's his right as a parent to have that private liberty to establish the rules that he wants to establish for his children. But that's the policy behind state action. So what are some other examples 
of actions that might be commonly tested or more commonly tested that are like clearly not state action. Basically private actions that we're not going to be able to attribute to local, state, or federal government. Think about something we've already talked about in the Fourth Amendment. Think back to our criminal procedure lessons. If you've seen our criminal procedure lessons at this point, if not, remember a really basic example because this one I think also kind of helps illustrate the idea here. Remember, when we're thinking about Fourth Amendment protection from unreasonable searches and seizures, does this apply to private people or does this only apply to the government? Right, well, we know the state action requirement is going to apply to the Fourth Amendment. So if you work for a private company, right, say that you work for a company that does not receive any government funding, that does not have any government employees, it's 100% privately held company. Okay, and let's say that your boss suspects that you are hiding illegal drugs in your desk drawer right, or anywhere in your belongings, could your boss go and search, it, or if your boss went suspecting that you had hid drugs, could your boss go and search through your desk to look for drugs, right, without a search warrant, right? Would the boss be violating your Fourth Amendment rights if he goes into your stuff and starts looking to search for and seize, basically, drugs? And the answer is going to be no. Your Fourth Amendment, your Fourth Amendment rights, your Fourth Amendment protection from unreasonable searches and seizures are not going to be violated by your boss because the Fourth Amendment does not apply to your boss. The Fourth Amendment only applies to state action. If a police officer came into the office without a search warrant and no exception and started searching through all your stuff trying to find drugs, that would probably be a Fourth Amendment violation, right? Because that police officer is state action. That police officer is a government official acting within their official capacity. We can attribute that action to the state very easily when it's a police officer. But we're not going to be able to attribute your boss in a private company you know, going through your stuff to the state. That's not an action that we can attribute to the state. So without the state action requirement being satisfied as our gateway issue, the Fourth Amendment would not be violated if it was your boss going through your stuff. So we see in a lot of these fact patterns, if we change, if we leave all the facts the exact same, but we just change who the party is, the outcome is completely different. I mean, imagine back to the example with my dad, establishing rules where he says, if you complain about me or your mom, you are going to be punished. Imagine if the government passed this law. If Congress passed a law that says, you know, if you say anything negative about Congress, you're going to be fined $1,000. Well, we know that would very obviously satisfy the state action requirement. And we haven't talked about the First Amendment yet, but that's going to be a very obvious freedom of speech First Amendment violation. Okay, so just changing who basically the party is can obviously have a huge impact here. And what I'm trying to illustrate is there are some cases where state action is going to be very obvious and there's going to be cases where state action is basically more in this gray area. You know, but we really want to understand before we get into the gray area, because all of this is going to be the gray area, we really want to understand actions that are obviously attributable to the state and actions that are obviously not attributable to the state. Okay, so if we're thinking about actions that are generally not attributable to the state or very obviously not attributable to the state, you know, we talked about one, right? We've talked about two, my dad establishing rules, there's no state action there. Your boss rummaging through your things in the office, no state action there, no constitutional violation. Think about other situations though. Think about like private schools. Think about private schools or churches establishing a religion, right? Think about, you know, a private school that receives no funding from the government and doesn't have any government employees. You've probably seen, you know, religious-based private schools. You know, a Christian private school can exist because 
the state action requirement is not satisfied. We know if the government came along and set up a public school that was funded by the government and all of the faculty and staff are government employees, and at that public school, the government tried to establish a religion. Say, you know, in the mornings, we're going to say a Christian-based prayer and we're going to take classes on Christianity. We know that this would be First Amendment violations. The government cannot establish a religion, really can't show favoritism of one religion over another, right? That's all First Amendment issues. But a private school that's not the government can establish a religion, right? Obviously, if a private party wants to go and establish a church, you know, if a pastor wants to set up a Christian church and as a requirement to his Christian-based church, you have to be a Christian to be a member of his church, he's free to do all of that, right? Because he's a private actor. He's not, there's no state action. Okay, so if you have private schools, which are going to be schools that are not receiving government funding, that don't have, you know, that aren't 100% funded by the government. If a private school is getting like some small amount of funding from the government, but they don't have any government employees, they're probably still considered private. When a school is receiving 100% of its funding from the state, basically, and all of the employees or the faculty and staff are all government agents or government employees, then in that case, it's going to be considered basically an arm of the government, right? The arm of the state. When it's completely state funded and all of the employees are employees of the state. Okay, so the, the point here is sometimes, you know, the state action analysis is very obvious, very straightforward. You know, if it's somebody's dad is establishing rules, no state action. If it's a pure private school setting things up, generally no state action. If it's a public school, you know, totally different. Generally is going to be state action. You see a public school trying to start, establish a religion, okay. Okay, so, you know, we have this difference between things that are obviously state action and things that are obviously not state action. So what we wanna think about in terms of, you know, what is obviously state action? The last note I'll make here, because, most of the constitutional law fact patterns we look at, if individual rights is being tested, typically state action is satisfied. Because if we see any fact pattern, think about the three branches of government. You have the executive, the judiciary, and the legislative. If you see any executive action, right, the president is issuing an executive order, right? That's direct state action. If you see the judiciary, right? You see a court is issuing a court order or some sort of judgment, right? In those cases, that's direct state action. An actual branch of the government is taking action, right? That's clear state action. But maybe the most important to recognize, because what we most classically see tested, if we're thinking about individual rights in constitutional law, is legislative bodies enacting laws, enacting legislation, whether it's at a local level, state level, or federal level. I mean, the most classic individual rights constitutional law fact pattern usually goes like this. Typically, you're going to have a government body whether again, whether it's local, state, or federal, is going to pass some sort of law, some sort of statute, some sort of ordinance, right? But this governing body is going to enact some kind of law. And of course, that law is going to negatively impact some person in our fact pattern. And so that person who's been negatively affected by this law is going to want to challenge the constitutionality of the law. Maybe under the First Amendment, maybe under the Fifth Amendment, maybe under the Fourteenth Amendment, just depends on the fact pattern. Okay, and then the call of the question is going to ask you to determine whether that law as applied to this plaintiff is constitutional or not. It, does it constitute a violation of the Constitution or not? And in those cases, Right, the doctrine of state action will still be the first thing that we think about because it's our gateway issue, but it 
the state action is going to be easy to see there. The action is the actual enactment of the law, right? That legislative body passing a law and now the, constitution, the constitutionality of that law is being challenged. Okay, well, the state action is easy to see there. The actual state, right, whether that's local, state, or federal government passing the law is what satisfies the state action requirement. And a lot of times, I would say most of the time, that's what our fact patterns look like. We have a government body passes a law, that law is applied to a person, and that person is affected negatively somehow, so they want to challenge the constitutionality of the law. Okay, in that case, state action is going to be satisfied. Okay? So those are the situations though where state action is obviously satisfied, where we have an actual you know, government body taking action, whether that's an executive government body, a legislative government body, a judicial government body, or representatives of these bodies, you know, the president as a representative of the executive, you know, a judge as a representative of the judiciary, any government employee, a police officer, as we already talked about, any government employee, employee taking actions in their official capacity. It could be the mayor of a city, the governor of a state, right? A representative and the legislative bodies, Congress, whatever it is, right? If you have a government official taking action in their official capacity as you know a government employee, that's going to be very obvious state action. Or if we see government bodies, you know, legislative bodies passing laws, we see the court, right? Some court is issuing a judgment or a court order, or we see the executive taking action, okay? All of those are direct examples of state action, and we don't want to get confused there. So the point is, we have on one side, actions being taken purely by private parties that are very obviously not state action. This is like my dad putting the rules on the fridge, right? Okay, no state action. On the other side, we have clear state action, right? Congress passes a law and then a person challenges the constitutionality of that law. Okay, very clearly state action is satisfied. So what we end up with though, is somewhere in between, right? We have a line that has to get drawn between what is state action and what is not state action. And this is where the closer we get to that boundary line in the middle is where this analysis gets very gray, very fuzzy, because there just are no bright line rules. Like literally the line is very blurry. It's not a bright line test to determine whether something is state action or not state action in the situation where we have actions of private parties that could be attributable to the state. Okay, because up until this point, what, we're really, what we've really been focusing on is like pure private actions by private parties. That would be like my dad establishing rules that we have to follow. Okay, that's clearly not state action because that's a private party and that's a purely private action. There's just no way we can attribute that to the state. And on the other side, though, we have actions being performed by the government directly. Okay, that's obviously state action. But sometimes we'll see in limited cases, the actions of private parties can be attributable to the state, to the government. And this is where the analysis starts to get a little bit complicated. And we have two major categories we want to think about here. When we're trying to think about situations where the actions of private parties could be attributable to the state, there's two major scenarios. And by the way, by a private party, what we mean here is somebody who is not employed by the government. Okay, so this would be like my dad, right? Just as my dad. Or, you know, someone who's not acting within their official capacity, 
of whatever their government agency is. Okay, so that's going to be one example of a private party where we actually have an individual who's not a government employee or who is not acting within their official capacity as a government employee, right? That's a private party. But also you have groups of people, associations of people. This could be, you know, incorporated or unincorporated. You could have an incorporated for-profit corporation that's a private party. You could have unincorporated, you know, associations of people. You could just have, you know, a private chess club, a group of people that get together and play chess, right? That's a private party. That club, that group, that organization, right? So long as they don't have any government employees or and they're not getting funded by the government, they're very obviously private parties. Okay? So if we have a group of people the two major factors in determining whether or not they're private, do they have any government employees, are they receiving government funded? If a group of people is 100% funded by the government, and that means they're all government employees, because if they're 100% funded by the government, that means all their salary is being paid by the government, usually means they're government employees. So those organizations are going to be considered government organizations. So any action that those organizations are taking, if they're 100% funded by the government and all of their employees are government employees, we usually call those arms of the state. This would be like a public school, right? A public school that is 100% funded by the government and all the faculty and staff are government employees. That's going to be a public party. That's a government party. We call that an extension or an arm of the state. So if that school goes and takes actions, that will satisfy the state action requirement. But if we have a school and they don't receive any funding from the government and they don't have any of their faculty and staff are government employees, right? They have no funding from the government and none of the staff or faculty are government employees. It's generally a private party, okay? So it is possible though, and that's what we're getting to. So just trying to define what a private party is and what a government party is. So, okay, we know what a private party is. It's still possible just because a private party is engaged in an action doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the analysis because actions of private parties may be attributable to the state in limited cases. And we have two major categories. Number one, the action of the private party constitutes performance of a public function that is traditionally the exclusive function of the government. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata videos. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. 
not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else. Um, in any of the other online resources that i found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career, and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.